If you have your Bibles this morning, I would encourage you to turn with me to Acts, Acts chapter 17, verse 26, and that's where we will start this morning, Acts chapter 17, verse 26, and if you're able, I'd ask for you to stand for the reading of Scripture this morning, just one verse, Acts 17.26 Scripture says He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. From one man Adam who God created in the Garden of Eden every nation of the earth was eventually And not only was God sovereign over Adam and the creation of mankind, but Scripture tells us here and elsewhere, by the way, that God is sovereign over the creation and the advent of nations. The rise and the fall of various peoples and powers. He determined their appointed times, when they would rise, when they would fall. He appointed their boundaries, the extent of their geographic location and their expansiveness. God is sovereign over it all. <clears throat> the existence of the United States of America is consistent with God's ordained plan. What's going on in Ukraine and however that falls out is not surprising to God. God is sovereign over the affairs of and the boundaries and the extent and the rise and the fall of nations, including, as we have been studying in Joshua, the demise of Canaan and the advent and rise of the promised land of Israel, which we will look at again this morning. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this series that we've been studying in the book of Joshua. Lord, I just pray this morning as we open your word that you would speak to us through it. Uh, this is a a challenging message today in that, Lord, it's not a traditional passage that is often preached on. I pray that somehow through it you would speak to us uh, and, and say to us whatever it is that you would have for our hearts today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated, turn back to Joshua chapter 10. Last week we stopped in the middle of this chapter, and so, so today we will pick up in Joshua chapter 10, starting in verse 29 and following. As I mentioned in my prayer just now, the chapters that we're dealing with today are not what you would typically call um, popular sermon material. <laughs> they are uh, chapters that are not uh, probably as... Uh, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they just aren't as engaging as a lot of the stories and the other content that you read in Scripture. You know, there are some places in the Bible that when you read it, it's just facts and it's just lists and it's just names and it's just kind of mundane. And that's what we find this morning. The latter half of chapter 10... All of chapter 11 and all of chapter 12 of Joshua, for the most part, list just um, very few details. Basically, it's just a list of the remaining cities that Joshua and the Israelites defeated during their conquest of Canaan. All of the exciting and engaging stories that we've been looking at so far and all of the vivid details about the various battles that we've talked about up to this point are not found in these chapters. So way back in chapter uh, 5 or 6 or whichever one it was, somewhere around in that area, when we read about the commander of the Lord appearing to Joshua and giving him this grand battle plan to attack Jericho, and then we read about 
the children of Israel coming to Jericho and marching around the city for six days, once each day, and then the seventh day, seven times, and the walls falling down, and then attacks. I mean, you've got all of this wonderful story of how all of that happened. And then we read in the chapter following about how they, the children of Israel attacked the city of Ai, and how they were driven back, much to their surprise, and even suffered some casualties. And they come to find out there was a, a man named Achan who had taken some things from Jericho uh, that he wasn't supposed to take, some of the spoils from the city. And it buried them in his tent. And as a result of his sin, uh, uh, the whole camp paid the price. And God told Joshua, he said, you've got to deal with this sin because until you do, you're not going to be able to continue in this conquest. You're going to, you're going to continue to run into brick walls and suffer defeat until you deal with the sin in the camp. And once the sin was dealt with, and uh, Achan and his sin was removed from the camp, they went back to Ai, and you remember they, they set up an ambush behind the city, and they came, and the people of Ai came out, and the ambush jumped on the city, and then they attacked the army in the middle. And you got all this engaging stories and details. Last week, we read how the Gibeonites had, had tricked Israel into a peace alliance with them, into a treaty. And then the other kings, some of the other kings formed an alliance uh, because they felt like that the Gibeonites had betrayed them, which they had. <laughs> and they attacked Gibeon. And Gibeon called for Israel to come to their defense. And Joshua and the Israelites came to their defense. And they attacked them and drove them back. And remember, God caused the sun to stand still in the sky so that Israel would have more time to fight against their enemies and to strike them down. And they pursued them as far as the city of Magadha, striking them down. And then the, the kings hit, the kings of their adversaries hid in the cave, and they brought them out, and they, they killed them and hung them on trees. And, and then they destroyed the city of Magadha. And we've got all of these details up until the middle of chapter 10. And then when we get to the middle of chapter 10, it kind of just turns into a list. And then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And we'll see that this morning. I've been worried all week about this sermon because it's, it's one of those texts that's like, okay, how do I make this into a message? How do I make this engaging or interesting? How do I keep you from going to sleep? I don't know. I'm going to try and I'm going to trust that God has something to say to us because here's what I know and here's what I believe. Every word of the Bible is there for a reason. Every word of the Bible is God-breathed. And even though some of it to us may seem more tedious than other, I think every word's important. And so this morning, though it may be challenging, stay with me, and we're going to go through these chapters together in the time we have this morning, and I'm going to trust that somehow, someway, God's going to talk to us through. So, we're covering two and a half chapters this morning in a very short period of time, and so I'm not going to have time to read all of it to you but let me just kind of, before we begin, give you an overview of what we're going to find, and then we'll go back through it. In the latter half of chapter 10, if you have subtitles in your Bible, mine says Joshua's conquest of southern Palestine. By the way, FYI, trivia note, in the newer editions, that word Palestine is not there. Because the word Palestine wasn't created, didn't even exist, until the Romans made it up. The reason that's important is because the Palestinians are not an ancient people that existed prior to Israel. They do not have a right to this land as they claim. I'm getting a little political here. So in the newer versions that says Joshua's conquest of southern Canaan, which is what it should say. Okay, so that was for free. Okay, let's... Let, when you hear the Palestinians were there first, no, they no, were not Palestinians didn't even exist as a people group until they were created in the early 1900s. Set that aside. The latter half of chapter 10 basically gives us a, 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 a summary of the conquest of southern Palestine. 
And we'll go back and look at it in a minute. Chapter 11, northern Palestine. Again, I say Palestine, it's not Palestine. Northern Canaan. <clears throat> and that's corrected in, in the newer versions of Scripture. Northern Canaan. And this gives us basically a summary of the battles that took place in northern Canaan. And then if you go to chapter 12, it says, Kings defeated by Israel. And in this chapter, particularly in verses 9 through 20. Four, you can look just real quick and see. It's basically just a list of all the kings that were defeated during the conquest of Canaan. So with that as your backdrop, I'm going to take the information found in these chapters and mold it together and try to summarize in this morning's message the remaining portion of the conquest following the Battle of Makeda, which we studied at the end of last week. In order for this to make sense to me, I'm going to, at the end of the sermon here in a few minutes, use a map to try to piece this together to help you understand it better. But for now, let's just walk through uh, the text part of it. So let's go back to chapter 10. I'm not going to read all the verses, but I am going to kind of just uh, skim through them. After the Battle of Makkah in verse 28, which we ended with last week, the conquest of southern Canaan began. Joshua and all of Israel with him passed from Mecca to Libna and fought against Libna. And the Lord gave it to him. He took out its king, he struck down all the persons, he left no survivor. He, he destroyed the city as, as we've seen in the past. Verse 31, and then Joshua and all of Israel went from Libna to Lachish. And they fought against it. And he captured Lachish and he struck it down. Okay? Now, something I'll just point out is Lachish was one of the five cities that was in an alliance back in chapter 10. So the army of Lachish and the king of Lachish had already been killed. The king of Lachish was one of the five kings in the cave that was killed and hung on the tree last week. So basically what he's doing is he's going back now actually to the city of Lachish. Because remember that battle was fought at Gibeon. They all converged. He's now going back to the city where the people and inhabitants still remain and he's taking the city. Okay? From Now there's an interesting detail here regarding Lachish. Look at verse 33. And Horam, the king of Gezer, came to help Lachish. And Joshua defeated him too and left no survivor. So here we have an interesting thing. Lachish, again, as I said, was largely defenseless. It had already been defeated. I don't know what that sound is. But it was largely defeated. And so uh, the, the king of Ge Gezer came to try to help them and he was defeated also. Let's see what's going on right there. Well, guess what? Oh no. It went out. Well, that's going to make this a lot more complicated. <laughs> no, I need a new light bulb, probably. I don't know why it's so loud. I'm sorry. Huh. Oh, would you walk back behind in the back by the baptistry? And there's an orange extension cord plugged in the wall when you unplug it. Alright, so, let's go back to the text. The king of Gezer came down to help the people of Lachish to no avail. He was defeated also. And so then, Joshua and Israel went from Lachish to Eglon, which was another one of the five cities in the alliance that had already been defeated. And they took its city proper as well. And then from Eglon, they passed on to Hebron. And there they defeated it also. And so he swept through all of these cities uh, that had already been previously defeated in the Battle of Gibeon. However, now he actually went to each of the cities one by one so as to uh, strike the city itself and the inhabitants there thank you Owen and the uh, uh, take spoil and so forth 
So we captured that city as well. And it says there in verse 37, left no survivor. And Joshua did, uh, Joshua and Israel then went to Debir and fought against it. And they captured that city as well. And from Debir, he went throughout the hill country, I'm in verse 40 now, and all of the Negev and the lowlands, and utterly destroyed all of their kings, leaving no survivor of all who breathed, just as the Lord had commanded. So Israel struck them all the way to Kadesh Barnea to the south, as far as Gaza to the east, and, and then back to Goshen to the north, crossing the land, uh, I'm sorry, back to Gibeon to the north, crossing the land of Goshen. Since I don't have my map, I can't show you all of these places, but nevertheless, all of the southern region of Palestine, he systematically went through it and took out all of their cities and their kings, leaving the hill country, which is in the center of the country, and traveling southward into the Negev Desert and taking out those areas. Now, there is something interesting in, in chapter 11 that goes with this information in chapter 10. So let's turn over to chapter 11. Look at verses 21 through 23 real quick. And Joshua came, came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Debir, and from uh, Anab. Now, we just mentioned Hebron and Debir back in chapter 10. Now we're adding the city of Anab as another one of the cities that was defeated. And from the hill country of Judah and from the hill country of Israel, Joshua utterly destroyed all of them, that is the Anakim, in their, with their cities. So there was no Anakim left in the lands of the sons of Israel. Only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod did some remain. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to the divisions of their tribes. And thus the land had rest from war. Well, what he's saying there is this, that there was a people group known as the Anakim. The Anakim were the descendants of Anak. And Anak uh, was their, like I said, Anak was their ancestor, and so they were called the Anakim. In his, in, his, in his honor, by his name. But these were large, mighty men of renown. Some said that they were related to the, uh, to the uh, Nephilim who lived prior to the flood. But the flood would have wiped out all of the Nephilim. But the Anakim came after the flood. And so, somehow or another, uh, the the race of giants, if you will, extended after the flood through the Anakim. And the Anakim had settled by and large in southern Canaan, in the cities of Hebron and Debir and Anab. So as we think about the conquest of Joshua, when Joshua began to proceed southward, the southern campaign, by the way, if I never said that, that's the on your bulletin, number one. The southern campaign, when they started southward and they came to these cities of Hebron and Debir and Anab, not only did they take the cities and destroy just all the regular folks that were living there, but they also wiped out the Anakim race that was living there. They took out the, the giants that were among these cities living in southern Canaan. With the exception, and this is noteworthy, with the exception of those that remained, did you see that? In Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Now if I had my map behind me, I would show you that, God, that central Israel is here, well, over here is the Mediterranean Sea, and Gaza and Gath and Ashdod are right along the edge of the Mediterranean Sea in a land that would be become known as Philistia. And the Philistines would rise up from those people. So the only giants that remained after the conquest were those that lived in the area that would eventually become the Philistines, 
And who would be the most famous of those giants of the Philistine? Goliath. Goliath. So you can kind of piece that together. By the way, if you want a modern application, they fled where? To the cities of Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Well, guess what? Gaza is the name of the whole region. Have you heard of the Gaza Strip? That's a modern phrase referring to that land that used to be the Philistines years ago. The Gaza Strip, by the way, is where we find uh, the Palestinians. Uh, not, not all of the Palestinians. There's Palestinians in the West Bank. There's Palestinians in the Golan Heights, about Lebanon. Uh, there's Palestinians down in uh, Gaza. And they... The Gaza Strip is a place of constant turmoil. But all of this pieces together when you begin to really study it and understand it. But nevertheless, during this time, the Anakim, the, the giants who remained, fled to the area that would become Palestine. The others that lived in Hebron and Debir and Anab and the countries that would eventually become part of Israel were completely eliminated. And thus, the southern campaign. Joshua cut into, they crossed the promised land into the central part of Canaan, and there was a central campaign, and then they turned south, and we read about that here in chapter 11, and took out all of the cities in the south, the southern campaign, all the way as far as Kadesh Barnea. Now that's significant too, because if you remember, Kadesh Barnea was the place where Moses had originally sent the 12 spies into the land from Kadesh Barnea to the north to spy out the land. Well, guess what they had seen? They had seen the Anakim in the cities of Hebron and of those places, and then they went back and said, I don't think we can defeat these people, and then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But now, under Joshua's leadership, these mighty Anakim, for the most part, are taken out. After going as far south as Kadesh Barnea and, and then eastward to the Mediterranean coast of Gaza, across the land of Goshen, and defeating all the kingdom between, he returned back, back to Gibeon and then to Gilgal, thus completing the southern campaign against Canaan. All right. Now then, we get to chapter 11. And this is point number two, the northern campaign. Then it came about, when Jabin, the king of Hazar, heard it, he sent word to Jobab, the king of Madon, and the king of Shimron, and the king of Akshaph, and to the kings who were in the north hill country, and in the Arabah, and south of Chinneroth, and the lowland, and the heights of Dor to the west, to the Canaanite on the east and in the west, the Amorite and the Hittite, the Perizzite and the Jews in the hill country, and the Hivite at the foot of Mount Hermon in the land of Mizpah. And all of these people came out as one with their armies with them, as many as the sea on the seashore, and they had many horses and chariots. So these kings came together and met, and they camped together at the waters of um, uh, Merom to fight against Israel. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because tomorrow I will deliver them into your hands, and you will slay them, and you will hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. And so all of, uh, of the people of Israel went to war uh, with them, attacked them at the waters of Merin, and the Lord delivered them into their hands, and they defeated them and pursued them to all of these various places. And Joshua did as the Lord told him, and hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. Read in chapter 10 that the cities of Jerusalem, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon, and Hebron all came together in an alliance to fight against Israel at Gibeon, and they lost. Well, a similar thing happens during the northern campaign. The king of Hazor sends out word to the kings in the north. He sends out word to the king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, and to the king at uh, Achef, 
and as far east as the city of Dor. Now again, if I had my map, I could show you where all of these are. But we're talking about in the extreme northern regions of Israel. When you see here, it says Chinaroth. There in verse 2, in and around Chinaroth. Chinaroth, we know that as the Sea of Galilee. But you see, the word Galilee didn't exist yet. Galilee was a region in Roman times. Galilee, Samaria, Judea. In the Old Testament, the Sea of Galilee is the Sea of Chinaroth. And so we're talking about, here's the Dead Sea. You know that little lake up there? The Sea of Galilee? That's Chinaroth. So we're in the northern regions now of Israel. And all of these kings from all of these various cities are summoned to come together in a coalition to fight against Israel just as they had done in the south. And by the way, the result was largely the same. Joshua attacked them, having been assured by God of victory. Israel won, chasing them in every direction, pursuing them and striking them down. And he hamstrung their horses, and by the way, he burned their chariots. Now that's an interesting detail. The Canaanites, at least the northern Canaanites, had chariots. Israel didn't have chariots. The Egyptians had chariots. And now we see the Canaanites had chariots. But nevertheless, their horses and their chariots still could not stand before their army of God. And though they had aligned with so many cities fighting, and it says they were as numerous as sand on the seashore, still God fought for Israel and struck them down. So that the kings of the north were defeated. And although we do not get the exact details of how and where and in what order, we can assume that after defeating these kings, he did just exactly what he did in the south. He subsequently went to all of their various cities and captured their cities. Now what is interesting in the north that's different is look at verses, uh, let's pick it back up in verse uh, uh, 10 of chapter 11. So after winning this great battle against all these united kings in the north, it says he turned back and captured Hazor. Now remember, Hazor was the city who, back in verse 1, that was the city who started all this thing. And struck its king with the sword because Hazor was the leader of all of these other kingdoms. And he struck every person with the edge of the sword and destroyed them, leaving no one that breathed. And he burned Hazor with fire. And then he went about capturing all these other kings and the cities in the north and struck them with the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed them. Uh, however, look at verse 13. He did not burn the cities as they stood on their mounts, except for Hazor. So most of the northern cities were not burned or destroyed. That would be significant, significant in that when Israel took over the land, they would not have to rebuild these cities from scratch because they destroyed them. And so a lot of these cities would be resettled by Israelites later on. But he did take spoils and plunder, verse 14, and did strike the inhabitants of the cities and destroy them, leaving no one that breathed. And just as the Lord had commanded his Moses' Moses' servant and Moses then commanded Joshua what Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. That that Moses had been or that that Moses had been instructed to do, that he then instructed Joshua to do, that was completed in its fullness. The cities that Joshua destroyed do not include every single city in Canaan. He did not go to every single town and destroy. He did not completely annihilate all of the people. He took out the principal cities and the principal kings so as to subdue the nation, but his, his conquest was not complete in that he did not eradicate all of the Canaanites 
And he did not destroy all of the cities. However, the Bible affirms, as we just read, he completed what God told him to do. And what was going to happen, and we'll see it unfold in the coming chapters, is that he will then turn the responsibility over to the various tribes and say, okay, here's your land. You go now and displace anybody that remains and push them out. And some of the tribes did a better job than others. There's a message there, believe it or not. The message is this. It's not the extent or the size that matters. It's the level of obedience that matters. And that can be applied in a host of different ways. Joshua did not complete the entire 100% of the conquest. He did what God told him to do and was obedient to do that fully. We have to learn to be satisfied with what God gives us to do. And we need to do it faithfully and obediently. But that doesn't mean we have to do everything. It doesn't mean that we should try to do everything. We need to be obedient to what God calls us to do. Whether that in the eyes of the world looks big or whether it looks small. Whether we are given one talent or whether we are given five or whether we are given ten, we are responsible for what we are given. We should not measure ourselves against others. Joshua destroyed the cities, the kings, the people that he was called to destroy, and then he passed the responsibility on to the various tribes who, as we're going to learn in Judges, by and large failed. But that's not on Joshua. Joshua did what God called him to do. And so, the northern conquest was complete. There are cities listed in chapter 12 that are not mentioned in either chapter 10 or 11. That's why if I had the neat little map, I could show you all the different places where he went and took all these places out. But the fact of the matter is that he completed his conquest of Israel and returned to Canaan, and the land was at rest from war. Let's lastly look at a quick summary of the conquest. We looked at the southern campaign, the northern campaign, and there's some verses here that give us a summary of the conquest. Joshua chapter 11, verse 16 to 20 says, Joshua took all the land, the hill country, that is the central part of the land, the Negev, which is the desert to the south, the land of Goshen in the southwest, the lowland, the Arabah, which is around the, uh, the Sea of Chinnarah, the hill country of Israel and its lowland in the north, from Mount Halak, which is all the way down in the south, that rises towards Seir as far as Balgad in the valley of Lebanon all the way to the north. In other words, from the top to the bottom, he took it all. He captured all their kings, he struck them down. Joshua waged war with them for a long time. Now this is important. This morning in 20 minutes, I've given you a list of all the battles. But beloved, it took a while. It took a while. It's estimated that the conquest of Canaan took about seven years. And so if you add all of that time together, it took about seven years. Meaning that there was, you know, it wasn't, okay, we're, we defeated Lachish today and tomorrow we, we defeat Libna and then the next day. No, there was gaps of time in between all of these different battles. Ancient warfare took a while. It still takes a while today, but it took a while. Conquest went on for roughly seven years. And he fought all of these kings. Verse 19, there was not a city that made peace with him among uh, all of Canaan except for the Hivites who lived in Gibeon. Other than Gibeon, they took them all in battle. For it was the Lord, for it was of the Lord to harden their hearts to meet Israel in battle in order that they might receive no mercy, but that it might destroy them just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So of all of the cities 
that are listed in these verses and in chapter 12, all of the different places that Joshua went, the only city of all of them that made peace with Israel was Gideon. And remember, they're the ones that tricked him into making the peace treaty. God put it in the hearts of all of the other Canaanite peoples to fight against Israel. Even though they must have realized that they were going to lose. Joshua won everywhere he went. God was fighting with him. But did you see that? Kind of like God hardened Pharaoh's heart and he just kept stubbornly not letting the people go. And here comes another plague. I'll let him go. Nah, I changed my mind. Here comes another plague. I'll let him Nah, I changed my mind. Here comes another plague. It's like, uh, come on. Well, same thing here. God hardened their hearts. Verse 20. So that they kept fighting against Israel. And that was God's plan. Because this was God's mean of, means of bringing judgment on the Canaanite nation. God calls his nations to rise. God calls nations to fall. And this was the fall of Canaan. If you look at the early verses of chapter 12, I won't read them all to you. But the early verses of chapter 12, it talks about the kings beyond the Jordan River on the opposite side that had been defeated prior to the conquest when Moses was still living. The two most significant being verse 2, Shion, the king of the Amorites, and verse 4, Og, the king of Bashan. So if you add those two kings, plus, starting in verse 9, you just see a list. The king of Jericho, the king of Ai, the king of Bethel, the king of Jerusalem, the king of... You see a list. If you add those two in the, in the uh, opening verses with the 31 that are listed from verse 9 to verse 24, all together there are 33 kings that are named in Scripture that were defeated by the Israelites during the conquest. Two on the eastern side of the Jordan in the lands of Bashan at the north, Ammon in the middle, and Gilead along the coast of the Jordan River. And then the other 31 that are listed actually in the Promised Land proper all the way from Mount Hermon in the north to Mount Halak in the south. A lot of information here, just a lot of names, and it makes a lot more sense when you have a map that you could show. So maybe one of these days I could show you that map that I, that I made and, and, and how the conquest laid out. But nevertheless, you get the gist. Over a period of seven years, the conquest unfolded and under Joshua's leadership, by the power of God, the promised land was taken. The conquest of Canaan, as I conclude this morning, can be divided neatly into three parts. The central campaign, the southern campaign, and the northern campaign. Israel crossed the Jordan River into central Canaan. They attacked several cities in the central part of Canaan, seized control of those cities, and effectively cut Canaan in half. From that point, they proceeded south and defeated all of those in the southern hill country into the Negev Desert, conquering all of those kings, returning to Gilgal and resting, and then in the years after that, they ventured northward and took all of those cities as well. It was a brilliant strategy. Divide and then take it on half at a time. Joshua was an extremely brilliant military mind. But again, the reason for success wasn't so much Joshua, it was God fighting on behalf of Israel. What might be an application this morning? Well, I don't know, but let me give you this as we close. A conquest is an invasion of a foreign land with the intent to take possession and or control over it. I think this is your outline. A conquest is an invasion of a foreign land with the intent to take possession or control over it. It is important for us to realize that the conquest of Canaan was a one-time event in Scripture. 
one-time event. It was limited to a specific time, a specific place, and a specific people. Nowhere else in the Bible does God command His people to engage in conquest or any similar type behavior. All of the other warfare we see in the Old Testament was fought within the boundaries of Israel to defend Israel. Even in the days of the kingdom growing during the days of Solomon, it never grew beyond the boundaries that God established for it. And so the idea of invading foreign lands and taking them is foreign to Scripture. The idea of a holy war is not scriptural. The Bible does not teach or sanction the concept of holy war. The conquest was a one-time event ordained by God specifically to punish Canaan for their centuries of heathen idolatry and to give a permanent and everlasting home to God's people Israel which has specific boundaries and it's just a small sliver of space in light of the size of the whole world. Israel is roughly the size of New Jersey. The whole country is roughly the size of New Jersey. And the people of Israel, the Jews, throughout their history have never sought to expand beyond that. There has been no means of, of empirical worldview like the Roman Empire trying to take over all the different countries of the world. Or even more modern, the United Kingdom who took India and who took Australia and there are still remnants of the UK and the, uh, the, the uh, Virgin or not the, yeah, the Virgin Islands as a UK part of it. Uh, Israel's not that way. God does not sanction holy war. And let me close with this. I have heard critics say that Christianity and religion needs to be abolished because it's the cause of all the wars that have ever been fought. You've probably heard that. And they'll always point to the Crusades and talk about how Christianity is so evil and vile that if God is real, He is militant. And, and angry, and listen to me. I'm not trying to justify the Crusades this morning. That's not my point. My point is this. Even a secular historian, that's not a religious guy, a secular historian, according to the secular historians, less than 10% of all warfare that has ever been fought was fought in the name of religion. Less than 10%. And of that 10%. The overwhelming majority was not fought by Christians. I, get, I, I bet you can guess who it was. Muslims. Jihad in the name of Muhammad. The Bible does not teach us that Christianity or Judaism for that matter is to be spread by the sword. This was a limited, isolated, one time event. Listen. We're engaged in a fight, but we don't struggle against flesh and blood, Ephesians says. We struggle against powers of darkness, spiritual forces. And the way that we fight is by the spread and the proclamation of the gospel. Not through warfare or violence. And so, as we study this, it's important, it's interesting, but... Don't let that become in your mind, oh, then we are justified according to Scripture to spread our faith through warfare. No, no. This was a one-time deal. It's never been repeated and the Bible doesn't sanction that above and beyond just this one occurrence for a very specific and limited purpose. So, hopefully, maybe that's a message we can get out of this text this morning. Maybe there are others. Maybe God's been speaking to you about something totally different. I don't even know. But uh, if you have a decision to make, we're going to have a brief verse of invitation. 
Uh, and so, uh, you can come during that time. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this message. Lord, I pray that we, uh, as we talked about the conquest and the various cities and the various uh, exploits of Joshua and the Israelites, God, uh, we did more than just learn information, God, but I pray that somehow uh, you've been speaking to each of our hearts individually, uh, that we might hear your voice and, and clean some application for our lives. Lord, if there's any decision to be made this morning, I pray it be made during this invitation, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.